Welcome to the Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to the Behavioral View and this is episode four of season two and we are so delighted today to have two guests because uh, Nissa is here with me and Carrie could not be here today. So we are very delighted that Tim Fuller, our instructional designer at CR, no, you're not an institute, our instructional designer at Central Reach is stepping in. And Tim was with us previously when we did an ethics episode. So we liked him so much, we thought he would be a great fill-in host. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also joined by our guest panelist today, which is Dr. Becca Tagg, who is the Executive Director at Del Mar Center for Behavioral Health. And Becca, you are joining us today to talk about burnout, right? Yes, unless you want to change last minute, in which case I'm totally okay flying by the seat of my pants. But I think burnout and self-care. I think we should do that to people. We should invite you on to talk about one thing and then just launch into something totally different. (laughs) (laughs) I would be for that. That would be a great opportunity from the universe to practice flexibility. There we go. So that would be my positive (laughs) reframe, right? That's that's my psychologist in me coming out. I like it. Well, we do actually always start with something off topic and uh i was really excited that today when we for those of you who are watching um when we do the question of the day we usually offer a list to our guest panelists and say take one of these or give us something even better and um you came back with one even better because it's one of my favorite topics in the world Uh, dr becca wants to know our opinions on the best dog or best breed of dogs Anybody got strong feelings on that? I have a very strong feeling, and he's right back there if you're watching. Um, Black Lab is my favorite breed. So I've he's my second Black Lab. I had one through undergraduate and graduate school. Uh, he lasted until he was 17 years old and was just the most loyal, kind, sweet dog, so well-behaved. This guy, his name is Shadow. He's a fun dog. He's not as smart as our last black lab, but we also have three children. So I think he just thinks he's one of the kids. <laughs> oh, wow. I love, I love black guys too. I did have a mix. Um, my, my previous, previous dog also lived to be, I think she was 14 and she was a black lab mix and just oh. said the most adorable, sweet, loving animal. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But now for those of you who are my social media Friends, you already know, I do have a child. He's an adult now and he won't let me focus on him on social media. He put the mix on that like 10 years ago. (laughs) Daughter has four legs and fur and she loves to be videoed. She loves to be highlighted on social media. And she is my favorite breed, which is no breed at all or all breeds mixed together. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I I love a pound Mm -hmm. puppy. Hmm. <laughs> she's actually not even a pound puppy she was born under a friend of mine's um shed <laughs> and i was lucky enough to be able to go and get to pick up the litter and she is just the you know that's the thing about the mixed breeds you you don't really know what that personality is going to be there's an opportunity for any part of that to come out and just so receptive to training so very willing and interested language she loves words she can learn a new word in a day which everyone says she's so smart and i say she's so well trained (laughs) Mm -hmm. yep so that's mine 
I sadly am, uh, uh, we are a dogless home at the current moment. Both of our dogs passed away within a few months of uh, each other uh, a, a few years ago. Um, my dog was a big mutt. Um, he had like a little bit of coon hound in him. So he had great color and a really good bark, uh, but he was no, he was no, couldn't pinpoint exactly what he was. And I loved him dearly. I still love him dearly. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's dog was a very little dog and we had a, a, a different relationship, one that was challenged at, at, at many instances. And that was a good, that was, that was good practicing patience if, sometimes and failing most of the time. Um, but I do like, I like all dogs really, um, especially when they're not yours and you don't have to like pick up their poo or whatnot. That's always kind of nice. Um, but I really like those German uh, uh, wire hair uh, dogs with the beards, you know, oh, yeah. and you get these just yes. really cute little beards and they're just adorable. I find those are, I, I admire those. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dr. Becca? Um, well, so my sister and dad are both veterinarians, and so they would say that mixed breeds are the best because you often get the best of all the breeds, and uh, the genetics sort of fall away for those um, common genetic issues. They also tell me that I probably single-handedly keep our vet in practice because I have two pugs that, uh, you know, genetically should not exist, and they do. Um, both are rescue pugs. Uh, from Mexico when we were in San Diego. And I just love their little personalities and they're such characters and the tail that looks like a cinnamon bun. Um, and like Tim, though, I, I think I like all dogs, like all, all, all dogs. Um, uh, Me so, too. Yeah. I'm the person that um, walking down the street, I will make your dog come to me, you know? <laughs> Or say hi to the dog before the person. And then I'm like, oh, my social skills could use some yeah, improvement. Yeah. There's a reason um, we go into these fields, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we kick off, we're going to talk about um, how folks who are watching this episode can get a CEU. So if you are already um, a, a member of the Institute, if you have a login, then um, you can just click the link and at the bottom of the video and you'll be taken straight to your account and you can um, select the secret words that we're going to be embedding throughout the episode. If you are not already on the Institute, then when you click the link, you will be offer offered the opportunity to create an account. Please go ahead and do that. It will not cost you a thing and you can then enter your your secret words there. Now you do have to pay for the CEU, but you do not have to pay to create an account. Okay, so our first secret word, I thought we would do something a little bit different because we were having some internal conversations about pronunciations whenever we get, um, we do a lot of recorded content and then we get things in from contractors who may say words differently than we do and we have these, which is right, um, and then you just hear it different ways. So I'm just curious what everyone's thoughts are. How do you pronounce this word? I'm, bringing, I'm sending it to you guys in the chat. Who's brave? Who will go first? <laughs> I'll, stereotopy. Yeah. Okay. I say stereotopy as well. Okay. I also say stereotopy. Okay. What about you, Becca? Stereotopy. I didn't know there was okay. another way. So, so unless maybe somebody's hearing differences in our dialects, we need a, a speech yeah. path to, you know, mm -hmm. get into the. Right. So some of the people in my um, listening circles pronounce this stereotypy. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not the only one. So I went to, where did I go for this one? Dictionary.com. And guess what they said? Let me play it. Stereotypy. Oh God. I know. And so I went to like three different of these automated ones um, for different kinds of dictionaries and they all say stereotypy. So Maybe we're all wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first or the last time I'm wrong, and that's okay. No, definitely. And mm, let's not even get into Southern accents and what that does to words. <laughs> all right. So let's launch into why we're really here. 
and that is to talk about burnout and self-care. And Becca, I think that we decided that we kind of talk about or launch into this by talking about what we mean by the terms themselves. So some clarifications. Yeah. Um, gathering my thoughts. So um, I often say I'm starting to get beef with like uh, self-care and, and um, burnout. And then one of my teen clients told me, Dr. Becca, nobody says that anymore. And then I was like, well, I'm 40. I wasn't cool before. I'm not going to start now. And the neurons that fire together wire together. So I keep saying it. Um, so I kind of have beef with the term burnout and self-care. And really it's in the same way that I am bothered when people say, oh, I'm being so OCD about this or, oh, I'm, you know, um, that's giving me trauma, you know, PTSD vibes. And I think it's because I'm a psychologist and behavior analyst. So accuracy is important and language is important. And so I want to be sure that I'm, that we're all using the same language and burnout is not just stressed. It is a clinical term. Um, it's actually in the ICD 10 and 11 in the 11 it's defined better. So it's actually, um, a reimbursable, like a, a, something that is clinically significant enough that you can seek treatment for from a medical provider, like a mental health clinician. So clinical burnout is not just stress. It's actually the opposite of stress. Stress tends to have this frenetic quality to it. I'm doing so much. And burnout comes after you've been doing that for so long that you actually burn out and that the energy is gone. And so you disengage. And um, that is is different than just being so, so stressed. Stress is normal. Um, it actually serves biological purposes. It, it makes me um, kind of get it together and study for an exam or, um, you know, put more energy into something that's important. It serves us well. Uh, I often think of it as a sprint and that sprinting through a marathon, I'm not a runner, but I see those stickers on people's car that say like 26.2. So I, I know other people do that. I know enough about biology to know that you cannot sprint for 26.2 miles. And so burnout is more like you sprinted too long and then you sort of collapse. And it's the absence of energy and caring and disengagement that comes from doing too much for too long. Does that make yeah, sense? I was just listening to Dr. Byron Wine talk about um, predictors mm -hmm. of turnover and such. And I think in a similar vein, he said that the one thing that is known is that when people start saying, I am just tired, that that is the biggest predictor that they're going to leave. And I'm wondering if that's related mm -hmm. to, I mean, it seems logical that, that, that it's a clear sign that they're burnt out. Yeah, or at least that they've been doing too much for too long. And so if we think about burnout, so we can measure it, right? It's not this nebulous concept. We can we can measure it. Um, the Maslock Burnout Inventory um, has a variety of different... Um, uh, like there's a human services one, one for medical professionals, different versions. Um, and... Uh, the three sort of scales within that are emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and then personal accomplishment. So I think that tiredness is that emotional exhaustion uh, that is often accompanied by physical exhaustion. And you disengage, right? Sleeping is kind of almost the ultimate disengagement. I'm literally not awake. And so we see things like calling out of work, um, being late, um, separating from social groups, because uh, you can be burnt out on anything, not just work. I mean, you can be burnt out on, uh, Dr. Christina Maslock talks about anybody who engages with other humans can burn out. So you can be burned out on a person or family, I mean, any group. So um, I, I often talk about it as it relates to work, because I see that as a 
a big, uh, well, my, was my dissertation and then subsequent research was on that area, um, but it can happen anywhere. And so when we do too much, energy is finite. It will come to an end. And that self-care isn't always the answer. And I think that's sort of my other beef is that self-care is, I feel like we're now telling people, well, if you're burnt out, just engage in self-care, which is often like chocolate or, you know, a massage. And the thing is, is to me, that feels victim blamey. Uh, I hate to use the word victim, but like you're telling this person they just need to do more when actually they've already done too much, that we have to look at systems of care and what I call community care. So as a business owner, I need to make sure that my team have adequate PTO and I need to make sure that they don't work 40 billables. It's not sustained. I mean, it, it, you can't do 40 billables because for every billable hour, there's, as a supervisor, there's usually a non-billable hour that goes with it. So then we're looking at like 50 to 80 hours. Holy crap. Nobody can do that, at least not ongoing, right? So I'm here at Camp Lejeune and we have PCS season, permanent change in station, where our military families get new orders. And so June tends to be a PCS time. And so I know I need to sprint in June. That means May and July, I need to make sure that myself and the team have our cups full so that when we have to sprint, right, and it takes some of the, the whatever your cup is filled with out of it, we can make it through June and not crash and burn. Oh, I'm so glad that, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. I know you've been talking about this a lot. I've, I've kind of surveyed your your approach, but hearing that summary is just so refreshing as a as a fellow professional, as someone, you know, these kind of these these holes that we find ourselves in when we talk about burnout or self care. They almost they sort of lose their their value because they they've kind of we've sort of diffused from what they really are intended to do. They used to be really clearly uh, articulated constructs and now they're sort of colloquial. And so it makes it yes. for the person who may be experiencing a very real listlessness or distress. It's almost like, again, another layer of, you know, almost diminishing the severity of their experience. And so it's sort of like, no matter where they turn, there's this lack of fulfillment and it's like, well, why would I go and get a massage? Now I've got to go do this. What, what do you, so I just, I really, I cannot um, yes. echo enough praise uh, for that, that summary there. Thank you for that. It also kind of thank you. I um, appreciate you. melds with something that I, I soapbox on a bit. And that is this um, balance when we're disseminating between um, taking science and, or, or knowledge and giving it out there into the world so that it can be used. I don't know any examples of that though, where it doesn't get watered down and reduced often to the point that it's not useful anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, self-care can suddenly start to sound like a joke in a lot of circles the way when someone is really, really suffering and where, you know, the answer is, well, a massage or a, a long hot bath or take a walk or, or yeah and it's such bigger picture issues and fixes that are needed yes and i i think one of the areas where we as behavior analysts are really well suited to support this is that um function over form right so if um, chocolate is, let's say I have disordered patterns of eating, um, in my learning history. And then somebody says to me, well, just have some chocolate, treat yourself. Well, okay. So one, I don't like the way you said that because even that treat yourself phrase is, is almost like making it jokey and yeah. it, stop. This is not a joke. Our health and wellness is not a joke. And chocolate for one person might be self-care and for someone else it may not. Sometimes self-care is hitting the red button on my phone when someone's calling because I don't have the proverbial spoons to answer, right? Sometimes self-care is um, saying no to a speaking request. I have multiple sclerosis and so I have a very limited number of spoons and I may really want to do it and 
at what cost? And so it, it is that function piece that sometimes I think we forget, or even, you know, one of my worries um, is I see a lot of this, oh, I'm going to self-care with wine. So, so I worry about that because we're using a substance. It, look, if you really enjoy wine and you're, you know, function for one person, it might be. But if we're regularly using a substance that changes or alters our mood, I don't know that that's self-care. That may be some warning signs, right? And and we as behavior analysts are really good at those um, uh, ipsative measures, right? Me compared to me, not me compared to Shannon or Tim or Nissa. And so um, we got to know ourself, and that's the hard work of ACT, right? I was just with um, Kelly, uh, Dr. Kelly Wilson on Friday at a, a workshop uh, here in North Carolina on his cross country trek. And this phrase that he said is really stuck with me and it's, it all starts at home, right? It starts at home. So how can I supervise or train or parent or um, provide mental health services if I'm not well? And so I have to know me. And when I know I'm off of my baseline, that's when I have to engage in some kind of self-care functionally related to the topographies I'm choosing that may not be good. Does that make sense? I, it makes a lot of sense. I, when I think about burnout, I think about compassion fatigue. I think about those environmental um, contributors, right? That could be the workspace that I'm in. Do I have support within my role? Am I overloaded on hours? Am I working across cities? Am I driving a lot? Um, I think about staff who, when they come to me and say, I'm burnt out, you know, using that um, phrase of engage in self-care. One, we don't know that individual, their learning history, what that self-care even looks like. So I think, you know, in speaking to this, we also need to be able to help our staff advocate for what is it that's going to help you right now? You are telling me you're experiencing burnout. I, I know you in a professional realm, but what can I do professionally? I, you know, I don't know you personally, but what can I do professionally to support this burnout that you're experiencing? How can I help? Is it reducing a few hours in the next couple of weeks? Is it coming in for more supervision? That's kind of what I think about in terms of ways I can environmentally support my staff if they come to me and tell me they're experiencing burnout. Yes, and I, I love that what you kind of mentioned there was what part are they burning out on because it isn't a burnt out period. It's usually there's something I'm doing too much of that I hate, right? Um, so can we decrease that? It's also about is there a passion project you want to work on? Like, what are you stoked on? And how can I help you contact more of that? We also do direct instruction on ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, acceptance and commitment training, if it's behavior analysts who aren't also mental health professionals. And I think the other part of what you said is you don't know what they need, but they may not either. Because our world so often says, if you need to do less work, let me know. But then you let the person know and then you, there's punishment related sure. to it. I mean, there it is not an accident that I'm in this field or that this topic is the one I'm so passionate about. I worked as a school psychologist for a few years before going back to school and specializing, re-specializing in clinical psych. And I burned out in the school systems and, and I internalized it. I thought it was me. I thought, how did I go to college for like 10 years only to suck at this. And really what I sucked at was setting boundaries and taking care of myself. And I suffer from helium hand, right? I'll do it. I'll do it. People pleasing. And so I didn't know that I was actually allowed to say no. I mean, if you think back in graduate school, at least my experience, which was great, but you see whatever patient darkens your doorway, you sign up for the everything. And so I didn't know that that wasn't what a career looked like. And so we do instruction with our teams about this is what this looks like. And we make sure that we have an EAP and that we have mental health coverage so that when somebody says to me, you know, Dr. Beck, I'm burned out, I can do what you said about let's do sort of this um, postmortem of, of your day and see what we can change. But also a reminder, here are the other things available to you as a human, so the EA, the employee assistance program, you can rewatch some of our recorded ACT webinars. Like, like what can we do personally too? Because while I know you professionally, you're a human. And so I can't be your therapist, but here are some resources that we have 
to help you be well as a human so that you can be well as a professional. I think that's so important. It reminds me of this. Um, Sarah Jaffe wrote a book, came out 2020, 2021, something like that. Um, Work Won't Love You Back. And so often we, mm. it, it's sort of this culture of uh, work as love and work by design, a lot of leaders inside of not just, I mean, this is, she didn't write it obviously from a behavior analytic perspective. I believe she's a journalist, but this idea that it is, it behooves organizational leaders to create an environment where you have everything you need. You have your friends, you have your, your treats. You, if you're experiencing issues, I can go and speak to an organizational leader. They'll help me. And it's sort of this kind of really toxic relationship to work in the sense that work isn't designed to love you. It can't love you. It's work and that's okay. And to think that work is going to give you the answers to the problems that perhaps work or at least the way that work occurs to you occasioned um, is not going to be helpful. You know, a, a day off mm -hmm. for a person that has a lot of vitality that is really enriched in their life is going to occur differently than someone who is experiencing burnout and has that same day off. They're, you know, that day may be filled with panic or with worry or with, mm -hmm. oh, well, it's just, I'm going to just have to go and do it again tomorrow. And it just, it really occasions more distress perhaps for, for that individual. And so I just, uh, I like this notion of balance, creating opportunities for people to find what's going to bring them that vitality, knowing that work might not be the place that's going to help you find it. And so there's kind of ownership on both sides. Um, you know, leaders really understanding that, um, that, they have a failure in perspective taking is what I'm kind of hearing in this a lot of like, but acknowledging like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to understand your perspective and that's okay, but I'm going to create a space where we can work through this uh, and we can make sure that you have the resource allocation and opportunity allocation so that you can really find your path because I do truly care about you. Um, that's the key. I care yeah. about you as a human more than an employee. And so I love what we do. That's also a risk yeah. factor. There's some really interesting literature about what are risk factors. And for our field particularly, there's a lot that, that, that track, like being younger, right? Uh, if you've seen Dr. Jim Carr's presentations, you know that most behavior analysts have been certified, I think it's three years or less, and now I'm unsure that I'm misquoting it, but you can go to the BACB's website by design, they're at greater risk uh, or inherently at greater risk. So is more education. So, I mean, so I dropped out of high school and then I have like three master's degrees, a doctorate and a postdoctoral master's, right? So tell me you're not trying to undo dropping out without telling me you're not trying to undo dropping out. And so, um, so we're at greater risk. I mean, BCBAs have at least a master's degree. Um, you know, there are, uh, the not having social supports is another risk factor. Um, you're identifying as your job is a risk factor because, um, so I shared I have MS and so cognitive dysfunction <laughs> occurs. And, and what happens if I can't be a psychologist or what if this patient doesn't get better? However, we define better. Do I then suck as a person? So making sure that we're encouraging folks to nourish all areas, not just the one that benefits me, because actually the one that benefits me is all the ones that benefit you. Um, and then one of the other ones that I thought was interesting that came from the special education literature is um, unpredictable student behaviors. And so, you know, many of us are working with kids with autism or related disabilities or adults with, um, you know, behavior challenges that might be getting in their way. And it creates this, I never know when it's going to happen. So you're kind of, I'm like on the edge of my chair here. That's not HRE, right? That's not relaxed and engaged. And it is an important part of work. You know, you, you need to be aware and safe. And so taking into account that unique contextual factor for our folks, um, 
we so scheduling is always a nightmare um but we sort of accept that right i practice my own acceptance doesn't mean i like it it means it just is um and we don't let folks be with kids for longer than about two and a half hours and then they have to have a 30 minute break after that they have to decompress and get prepped for the next child and so again that's that community care um to make sure that they're okay. Hell, I do the same for me. Like I can't see six folks back to back. And I'd be lying if I said that person number five got the same treatment as person number one if I did. And that's that ethical um, responsibility. You know, in our ethics code, it says that if there's something that could get in the way of our ability to provide quality services, we disclose that, we make a change, we seek support and consultation. And this is big stuff and there's, to my knowledge, never been or not recently been this whole new population of folks with a diagnosis that doesn't go away, right? So there's this hugely profitable um, new group of people who now, thanks to autism insurance, have access to this wonderful science of behavior analysis, which means that there's not enough of us and there's a ton of work. And when the work is helping people, it's hard to say say no sometimes. And yet this, Shannon, I think touches on what you're talking about is if we try to do too much, we spread ourselves too thin and then it's not quality and we lose some of that robustness of our science that actually doing less, uh, what do I say all the time? More isn't better, better is better. So if I can do for three well and sort of not do well for six, we got to do the three. That also means we're going to make less money as a business, but there's no pillow as soft as a clear conscience. You know, like these things are all tied together and I just feel really strongly about it and realize that. I know, know, but what you just said, I mean, there's so many things that, that, uh, you know, as you're speaking, my brain is compartmentalizing times that I was really happy despite having a very, like a, a lot of things going on in life that would be deemed extremely stressful um and times where i felt burnt out under the same sort of conditions so what were the differences and um i can talk a lot about that i think but i guess i, I kind of want to push on guilt because mm-hmm. even when what you just said you make the decision to do high quality for three mm-hmm. instead of six how do you not stress out and worry about the three that you're not serving and what is happening to them? And, and that when you sometimes have to make these decisions of that you do have limited resources, but boy, it's hard. It's hard not to uh, beat up on yourself about the people that don't get served because you made that choice. I had a, I think she was my pre-doc. I don't know. I had a supervisor somewhere I think, I don't know where, um, tell me, I was saying, I just want to catch up on my emails. And she said, Becca, you are going to die with a full email inbox. Let it go. And while that sounds like, ugh, yikes, it, it, what she meant was there is no catch up, right? It's do the best you can and let it go because there will never be enough to heal all the hurt whether it's maladaptive behaviors, whether it's depression, anxiety. Today is um, World Maternal Mental Health Day. I have special training there. And so there will never be enough to heal all of it. There's also ego in that, right? If I'm being honest, there's ego in thinking I could do it. Well, hell, my hair's shaved, it's purple, I'm covered in tattoos, I curse a lot. I'm not the best fit for everyone. Luckily, there's a Tim, a Shannon, and a Nissa too, right? So it's acknowledging that ego that it isn't all mine to hold that helps me put it down. And I say, self, there you go again. The sun does not rise and set on your body. Oh, you know, yes. like, I think I really like, needed to hear that because I oh, thought, yeah. oh, convicted, convicted. <laughs> it made me instantly feel better. So thank you. <laughs> but there, you know, there's something about, the person who will raise their hand and say, oh, that person um, smears poop and hit, that gouges their own eyes. Please let me go in there and work with that, right? So we do have, I think, um, in addition to some of the things that you're listing off as risk factors, 
there's probably some reasons that we join this field that also make us yes. <laughs> at risk for burnout on that. And thinking that you are the person who can fix these sorts of things would certainly be one because guess what? You can't always. <laughs> Yeah. And I like to think of our job as we've been in the field longer and we're doing more training of um, graduate students, that that's how I can help more people, right? I can only see so many folks in a day and we have a really strong student program and that's the way that we can keep things from being watered down, right? That we can really give good training. I've got goosebumps. I mean, that like that that is the way and it's by teaching them the true science, but also teaching them the things that are not on the task list that are the things that I see folks struggle with when behavior analysts or any profession aren't successful, right? And it's the letting go of the guilt and knowing how to organize your time and that it's okay to say no and soft skills and all of the stuff that comes along with humaning with other humans. Humaning is a verb. I like it. All right. I do have to pause us though, to do another secret word. Reinforce the folks who are watching and I have put it in the chat. How do you say it? Good one. <laughs> I say data every time. I think even when I'm speaking rapidly, I say data. <laughs> okay. I have been, I can, I can flop between data and data. I can, I, and I don't know the conditions under which that, that flop happens, but I, I, I can see it in myself that I can go both ways. On that. I'd like to collect data on whether I say data or data and under what mm -hmm. situations, because I'm a flip flopper as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am also a flip flopper and I was thinking, gosh, I wonder the conditions under which I say one versus the other. And I, it is, I'm sure some idiosyncratic rule that I have come up with in my mind that has not yet come to my awareness. But now that you've brought it up, I well, the am rest definitely of the day, gonna, the rest of noticed. the day I am. Yes. Yeah. At I've least. done it in a single sentence. I flip flopped in a single sentence, but, um, so I did a little deep dive to see what is the truth. The truth is that according to the rules of um, reading and pronunciation, it should be data, but that in American English, it is very common to flip flop and considered acceptable and the dictionary lists both. The British are more likely to say data and only data because it is correct. <laughs> and Europeans who are using data, um, it's going to be depending on where, whether, who they're hearing it from. Are they hearing the word pronounced mostly? through American English, or are they hearing the word pronounced mostly through British English? Hmm. And if they're influenced by British, they're probably saying data and Americans, they're like us, they don't know, and they're saying both. <laughs> so that was fun. I like a little deep dive. I was an English major first, by the yeah. way, if, for those of you who don't know. So <laughs> words, I love them. <laughs> it's reinforcing for me. me I can pause on deep topics like burnout and think about how to pronounce words. <laughs> So can we kind of um, move towards, I think we've touched on a little bit about what we can do to, to support or in an organization wide, how do we build a culture that honors the fact that people are going to need different things in order to stay happy in their jobs and not burn out. And I'm trying to avoid saying the word self care right now. So well, because I think what we're talking about is community care, right? If we're talking organizationally, it's up to me at Del Mar, and not me alone, but me with consultants and our other team members to hold those competing contingencies, right? So if I build 40 hours a week, we would have more income. I'd make more money at what cost? That's always my thought, not just in this concrete example, but what is the cost of this? And so... The cost is too great. And so making sure that folks have PTO and um, paid holidays, right? So you got to have both because you're out of work. And so folks may worry being out of work that then they're losing income. So then they're going to come to work when they shouldn't or can't. That's a problem. So adequate paid time off uh, for everyone. I've seen, I do consulting and I've been 
to be honest, aghast at the discrepancy between what's offered to BCBAs versus technicians. Aghast. And um, I mean, it really burns me because there is a huge power differential there. And our job is to take care of um, and actively create systems that support those with less power. And our behavior technicians, our RBTs, our paraprofessionals are those folks in most of the organizations we work. Um, We did a no charge um, online virtual event called Lean In and Learn in November last year that was aimed at behavior technicians. Um, It's we had speakers and it's hosted free on a YouTube page. So putting that out there for us was an act of community care. So um, adequate paid time off, um, health insurance that's affordable. Sometimes I see health in, which is a you know, object, uh, subjective word. So I see folks offer these health insurance plans, but folks opt out because they can't afford the monthly premium. So find a way as an organization, we pay 70% of the monthly premium for our folks. I mean, that's, and that's offered to everyone. I mean, it's, you know, full-time staff, but um, folks have to have access to care. Um, It needs to include mental health care. So what about our part-time folks? Or for us, we have a lot of military um, spouses who don't elect to use our insurance because they have TRICARE through their partner. So we have an EAP, an employee assistance program that offers, it's really robust, actually. It has mental health at no charge for them, um, but also helping them find babysitters and there's webinars and all kinds of stuff about wellness. And we talk about wellness. Uh, We have a values-based bonus card um, because clearly you hear the act in everything I do, right? But um, that's because it really... I don't know. I think it put words to how I was in the world and what I needed in the same way that ABA did. Um, And so they get points on this values-based bonus card for taking care of themselves. And so we reinforce it, right? I think the thing is, say what you mean and mean what you say. So if I'm telling you wellness is important, I better not penalize you for using PTO or telling me that you need less cases. And that is important as leaders, that we have to be congruent with what well, we say. Now you're getting, now you're we getting have to model it. Yeah, we're, we're like, yeah, because beyond that, there is this um, worship of the ideal of the overworked behavior analyst, you know, um, that we, we, we really heap praise on people who are everywhere doing everything. So what are we saying whenever we, we honor that and we show that as the model of what we think? Ideal yes. Or if we start salaries at, to be honest, $80,000 mm-hmm. at what cost? I, I mean, a lot of the billing or the reimbursement rates are public, you know, taxes takes about 40% off the top. Um, so as in like what we're reimbursed as a business and then overhead. So look at what you need to do in order to make that salary and, and everything's at a cost. So, you know, do you have, is that, are you billing an independent so there's no supervision, there's no mentorship, the trainings are at home on your own, you know? One of the protective factors is not just the amount of time worked, but the amount of stoke that you have on what you're doing, right? Like Shannon, when you mentioned there was a time you were super busy and you weren't feeling burned out and a time when you maybe were less busy and did, that's probably because you were super excited about what you were working on. So make sure folks have passion projects. And that's not just BCBAs. We have to do the same for our technicians. Not everyone can go back to school. And so how are we affording them um, ways to expand their skill set? Are we you know, taking care of them, um, offering them consistent hours, um, making sure that they're invested in. And then these group trainings where folks can get together, um, making sure they have adequate lunch space, a clean work environment, a staff space away from the kids. Not because we don't love the kids, but it's like we've all said is that when you hear something, the helium hand goes up and you want to jump in, well, then you're not on a break, right? When Um, I think about how we create a culture. I think about um, a couple contributors. One is there was a paper written by Plantaview in, I think, in colleagues in 2018, looking at social supports yes. and some of those contributors to burnout. Um, and when I think about my own work experience and what really drove me in the highlight of one of my clinical experiences, and there's a year, it's 2017, 
Um, I've run into those colleagues here at Austin. We've all kind of left um, the location we're working at. But when we all meet, it's like that year in 2017 was the highlight of our career. We loved working for this company. Um, and we loved our experience for so many reasons. And it leads me to that Plant of View and Colleagues paper because we had strong social support. We all were like-minded. We were passionate. We were in an organization where we, you know, um, one of the things we talked about a lot there was it was almost like you didn't know who played what role. You couldn't tell the RBTs from the BCBAs because when we were on the floor, we all supported the children. You didn't know who was a supervisor. We were just in on, on the floor playing, working, taking data. And then we had frequent training. We had opportunities to learn together, go out to lunch and say, here's what we learned during that you know, um, staff development day. What are we going to do in the clinic next? Let's all set up for targeting these skill sets for these children that we absolutely love, where we spend all of our time. So I think when I think about creating a culture, it's this like-minded group of individuals who are supporting each other, listening to each other, um, caring deeply, not only about each other, but the outcomes of those children that are in our care. And then the organization setting up an environment that really allows that, that passion, allows that doesn't create these, you know, this is who you are and you have to make sure you dress differently than the RBTs. It's just, you're all working very much towards the same goal and outcome. That's kind of how I envision that type of culture. And in my 2017, that year, it's the highlight of my clinical experience, I think. I can tell because you're smiling when you talk about it, right? And not just your, your mouth smile, it's the eye smile and your shoulders came down and you leaned in and, and these are the indicators right? Communication is not always vocal verbal. And so we need to be watching our folks for indicators because they may not know they're not doing well. Right. And so part of caring for them is checking in on your direct reports, your, your folks. And, and if you notice something's off, it's, I want to check this out with you. Uh, You can talk about it as much or as little with me as you'd like. And I just want you to know that I'm noticing something might be off. If you need something, let us know. Um, That's really great. Yeah. That, that article is a fabulous one. There's another one. I think it was from JOBM about um, um, the uh, organizational implications of gossip. That's another really good one because it's about changing behavior and the functions that gossip serves. And one of the ones that sticks out for me um, was that when folks didn't they felt like they didn't know what was happening. They kind Mm -hmm. of fill in the gaps. And I always thought that by sharing less with the teams, I was shouldering that um, stress and I was protecting them. But what I realized is that may not be the case, that they may have felt Mm -hmm. out of the loop and they do care about me. And so, um, so I, that article really encouraged me to share more as an owner than I was before. Not, you know, I mean, I don't want them to have to worry about all the things, but I can share more than I was because they do, when you create that culture that everybody feels buy-in for, they want to know these things to feel involved in how they can help. And what I thought was helping may not have been. And so that's another great article for folks who might want to look into that. Um, We read it regularly as part of our student training um, to help combat the gossip. I say, I'm not the thought police, but I am the behavior police at Del Mar. And so as soon as it comes out of your mouth, like um, now it's a behavior that is overt and impacts our organization, including mine. And so let's be aware. No, of that. I, the things in that, oh, sorry. Sharon. You go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just, I wanted to pick up on something that Nissa had mentioned because it was so, I, I mean, back at McDonough too, it's just the, the demeanor was so clear. It was, um, you know, sometimes you, you don't need to measure things to know that it's, you know, really meaningful in that instance. Uh, but one of the things that I, I do think can be a, a caution is when we isolate our times of great vigor to a particular period in time, we can run into some of the not so great parts of rule governance. Of, now I've created this rule around, and mm-hmm. bear with me, Nessa, I don't mean to, to pick on 2017. I'll use mine, 2013. Then you start to search back for, I'm going to go back to that time. And you can see this in, you know, whether it be work or relationships or something like this. And the distance of time has this beautiful way of only letting you feel and contact those nice things. Yep. Oh, I'm going back to 2013. It is going to be dynamic. We're all going to be on the floor together. We're going to be, we're building something. It's beautiful. 
And that is all true. But there is something really beautiful in acknowledging change. And, and what we've learned and, and uh, knowing that for myself, I can't go back there. I don't get, I don't get to have that. But I have, a, I have a responsibility to myself, to my own care and my own progress professionally to see, well, what are the conditions under which I can, I can create what is really meaningful to me now? And maybe I don't know what that is, but maybe I can carve out a path to kind of figure that out. And going back to this community care aspect, really enroll people that I feel I can trust, that I don't have to have all the answers. And I think one thing that can be really confronting for someone that's experiencing distress, especially at work, is that, well, we need to solve this problem for you because I care about you. But we got to, and that can be a dangerous game to play because it can feel confronting to. Oh, now I have a, oh God, I've got a problem and I've got to solve it. And, and I, I, now I'm letting people down at work and I've got this guilt and I just Mm -hmm. having this community, this space, it looks different for everybody, uh, creating a path for, um, not a way out, but a way in. And maybe it doesn't look like you're at that place anymore, Mm -hmm. that, that place of business, that relationship, that, that location, wherever, but a way in to the things that you love and, and that, um, that will bring vitality back to you. So I just, I really, I like that. Cause I was, when you were saying 2017, I was, Oh, I was back there in my space and I was excited. And I love that you picked up on that because it is something that I continue to grapple with as I have moved past 2017 to say, what was so exciting about that time and how can I reinvent that in, you know, my new space here at central reach with my new colleagues and how can we, form those types of relationships in a different environment, virtually, for example. Um, So it does help me, as I look back on that wonderful experience, look ahead with excitement to bring that to where I am now. And oftentimes when we are in that space that's awesome, um, that when I look back at this certain time, I think we all have those times, it wasn't that it was good all the time. So I like, Tim, that you're bringing that in because what made it so great was the the relationships felt yeah. so safe that when it was hard, it didn't yeah. take me down. Does that make sense? And so it was that acceptance of it just is. And when we don't try to solve, right, because we don't cure autism, we don't solve that, you know, TRICARE is challenging to work with and being committed to serving military families it just is. And so, so accepting it does not mean liking it. It means that it just is. I've integrated it into my experience. So I'm not fighting against it, right? You think of those finger traps that the harder you pull to change or fix, the tighter and more restrictive it gets. And when you can say this, it's, it isn't that, right? And so it's, it's trying to grab smoke 2017, 2013, whatever it is it's there. And so bringing the parts that were powerful then often includes the tough stuff. So like, it isn't that it was all easy. It was that the folks you were doing it with, you had the resources you needed, the social support, so you could manage and move through the hard things in the way that you wanted to. That's goals for me, not like making having a ping pong table at the clinic or all of these things where people don't want to leave it's it's you know what it is I've been seeing these memes I don't know if it's a meme I'm probably using the word wrong it's like stop giving people pizza parties I don't want pizza parties well I think that's crap what it is because I look, I look I love pizza and we have pizza parties we don't have pizza parties in lieu mm-hmm. of these other community care things I think that's what people don't want the performative measures whether it's at work or in whatever context we're in It's not the pizza. It's pizza without the other stuff. Does that make sense? I'll take pizza with, uh, so I've got some scratches right now related to jumping in and helping during an an escalated situation. I will take pizza with those scratches over pizza without the scratches because I was in it with that team member. They knew I was with them. I love being with the kids. I love being with our staff. And so it's you can't, it, it's that function again, right? It, it's function over form. That's so Oh, important. and I've seen people um, in the pizza party come get their slice of pizza and leave the group. And that is such a, that's, a, that's telling you everything that you need to know at that point. But and then I, with that, yeah. 
not making anyone wrong. You know, I think that's the other thing too, that I, that I, in my own personal experience, I have seen that, you know, there's this wrong making that just enhances the guilt. And, you know, I don't know what's there for that person that took the pizza and left, but I, I will take note and find a way to compassionately bring them in to me. You know, I'm speaking quite loosely here because it's, it's all very deep in metaphor at this point, but, you know, maybe the best way I could help them is to not go talk to them right now and really kind of give them the space that they need. And heck, I don't know. I like a quiet piece of pizza. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. But yes, it is data, data yeah. right? It is data that, that we take in. And it's you're right. It's nobody's right or wrong. Yeah. It is data. And so we are constantly, as leaders, taking data. And it's the parallel process of what we do with the kids. We need to do with our team members and, and teaching them how to use the analogy of the light on the person, right? So when I'm in a therapy session, the light is on. Um, the other person. When I'm in my therapy, the light's on me. When I'm in a supervision session, the light's on them. If I'm in a ABA session, the light's on them. When I feel that light start to go here, turn it back. And so teaching our BCBAs how to keep the light on the children, the adults, the parents, and the the everyone that they are serving. And then our job as supervisors of BCBAs is to keep the light on the BCBAs. It's really this light waterfall and no one's wrong, but we've got to take data and we have to know our folks. And some of that is related to community care of, you have to be in front of people to collect their data, right? I mean, it might be longer latency in email responses, which is still data. And then it's checking it out. I noticed this, is something going on? doesn't mean I'll solve it. I'm just, I want to, I want to check it out with you. Uh, and it's okay if you just need less time with me, man, I'm, I'm okay. That's okay. Um, Knowing like feeling heard and seen uh, is, I mean, that's that. I think that's one of the best things anyone can do for anyone else. Doesn't mean that you're doing anything with it, but to know that you're seen, you're here. I see you. I hear you. Um, and sometimes that's enough. Uh, and that, that is something that, employees can give to each other, even if they're not getting it from leadership. Absolutely. I think that, you know, you, 2013, 2017, for me, I go back to two different periods, but one of them I'm very lucky is that the first three years of my work, it was direct service. There was no such thing as RBT back then because I'm really old. Yeah. Same. That's okay. Same. <laughs> um, and I was working in what is now a politically incorrect system but the people who were there with me day in, day out, we I, there were some, some women who were 20 years older who were in the same job role, but had been, you know, honored. And they had their contribution at that level was valuable. And it was valuable to me as a 20 year old, for sure. And so they mentored me, even though they were, they were peers technically on the org chart and um there what they 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 had been there so long that it would have invited negativity if that had if they had let that in but there wasn't a lot of gossip there was it was severe problem behavior it was we you know we dealt with it we got through the situation. We still loved the person. We talked about the fabulous things that, that they're bringing to the table. And, you know, sometimes as a group, those of us who were tech level were really irritated at leadership, you know, but we still were happy to go to work every, work every day because the people who were in there with us had us and we were all going towards a positive mission. No one was there to undercut leadership, even though we might not have been very happy with them at that moment. (laughs) So I think all of this to say, the fact that I had that community at that critical point in my development allowed me as I moved forward, when I had the power (laughs) to create those kind of communities, was able to do that. So Becca, I really love and that you've been nice enough to share some of the your um, reinforcer assessment, your values yeah. assessment, trying to get in with people early on, and that you look at it repeatedly. Right? It's not just 
Yes. And that's part of our onboarding. Uh, the stuff that yeah. I sent you, we do reinforce our assessments <clears throat> or inventories for staff as well as values inventories for staff. <clears throat> um, we also, it's, it is about community. It's not just the whole Del Mar community, right? It's RBTs are a community that I'm not part of at Del Mar because my job is to support the BCBAs and our students. So our our RBTs who don't fall into one of those categories don't see me as much. So we do these RBT roundtables once or twice a month where BCBAs aren't invited and it's paid time. They get together and they check in with each other. Um, That's great. Not all of it's reported back to me. It, what's reported back is something I need to take action on, but I don't usually hear much about it. And uh, so I'm from Pittsburgh and we say nebby for nosy and because we're talking about words I was about to make. And my nebby ass wants to know what was said, but I don't need to know, right? And it's it's important for them to know that I don't need to know everything, but that I know they need time together. It's paid and it's important. And um, so creating those systems that as leadership, sometimes we can't be a part of in order for them to serve their purpose, no matter how much we want to be, because our stimulus mm -hmm. value is different. And you know, to that, Becca, making these kinds of resources available so generous. And the thing you said before about not making them performative is that piece that I can see missing sometimes. Like, oh, well, we're a value-based organization. We do reinforcer assessments. I gave you a gift card last week. Like, whoa, okay. None of that is really congruent with the conversation being had. And I, I think that, um, I think there's a, a great distance many organizations can cross to get closer to a non-performative, really functional, uh, really compassionate approach to their staff. And I, and you've been giving numerous examples. I think you should just, everyone just pay attention to Becca. Just I think so too. Go do, go, go to Del Mar Why? and check out what they're doing. I appreciate that. Uh, we also <clears throat> generally only have staff for three years or so. That's a military, um, sort of cycle. And so, um, we don't have people for long. And so we need to build community efficiently. Um, and sometimes at Del Mar, we are the community they don't have because they don't have family here and they move so much that for me, really being a military, um, focused organization, I have to acknowledge that contextual variable. It also means we on and off board people, more and so we have to get efficient at it and it's expensive but the money's going to come somewhere i think i just shared somewhere about i don't know maybe it was a casp about yes it's expensive to train folks well it's also expensive to not so pick mm -hmm. your hard pick where you want to put the money and and um not everybody's happy with me right because the other part is when you are value aligned in our values other folks may not share those values and that's okay. They're not wrong. It's just not a match. And we do require people to do their own work at home because we are a humans humaning with others. And sometimes folks aren't ready to do that. And that's okay. They probably won't be a good fit for us. A lot of times they'll come back later or, you know, they'll message me later and be like, gosh, Dr. Beck, I wish I had done this or I wasn't there. Man, I wasn't there in my 20s. And that's okay. It's it's about fit and and we're not the best fit for everyone, clients, employees, and that's okay. What we do, we do well, and I need to rest in that, which is my own challenge, right? Well, this, this conversation has, I don't know, it's been invigorating to me and calming at the same time, which is hard to do, so I do appreciate that. All right, we'll do our last secret word, and I should have typed it ahead of time, so I'm doing it now. So I, I say supervisory. What do you guys say? Supervisory. Okay. I say supervisory. I say supervisory and had not heard supervisory until I had been around more people I think from UNR and uh, like Nevada, oh, Colorado. And yes. they all oh. say that. Is that yours? I had never heard it before. And then, you know, I had heard it and I thought, Man, I'm noticing yeah. a pattern here. Um, so I don't know if that's like a regional. Yeah. I don't know. Tell us, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I cannot take myself out of myself right now. I don't, I cannot tell you anything. I'm, this is, uh, 
uh, I am, but I'm taking in that perhaps a pattern has been detected, which well, is Well, I, I will be honest that I first... Did you go to school there or live there? Because I, I don't know Taking, your sorry? background. Do you live in that area? Um, did you live in that area, like Colorado, I Nevada? I live in Reno. I am a, I, I oh, went to okay. UNR for a very long time. Uh, oh, okay. So, uh, we got some IOA yeah, so going on. Um, the, the smirk on my face is because I think you hit the nail on the head pretty darn good there. I don't know that, but I was, if, if Becca hadn't thrown that out, I was going to because honestly, I first heard it from Christy Fuller <laughs> and then I noticed Tim Fuller said it. And then as I was listening to podcasts, I heard it a few times and I would Google a person and they had a Reno connection. So that's my theory. We've, we're, we're, we've all been a weird bunch up, up here at UNR for a long it's time. It's one of those words, though, like supervision, supervisor, supervisor, supervisory. Which way are we supposed to go? I don't know. What does the Google say? Oh, yeah, good. Well, that's good. The Google says Tim's wrong, you know. <laughs> I take great joy in being wrong. Um, yeah. The ego likes it. The ego. Wrong. Who's wrong? You're just different. You're providing a different perspective on the word, and that is okay. <laughs> well, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Um, for our viewers, again, your secret words are <laughs> stereo, stereo. Okay, I'm trying to say them all correctly according to Google now. Stereotypy, <laughs> data, and supervisory. But if you want, as you type, think stereotypy and data and supervisory, no one will judge you for it. It is perfectly fine. Just make sure you have all three. And Becca, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I've really enjoyed it as all well. Right, guys. Um, and before I go, I do want to make one little announcement or combo of announcements about things upcoming on the Behavioral Review because we... Had such a good time doing hot topics with Nissa when she first came on. We decided that maybe we would do um, an in-between episode, so a shorter, like 30-minute, just couple of topics. And um, so we're going to be doing starting those in June. But we're also going to all be at ABAI, and we're going to be doing something live from ABAI. Uh, through the behavioral view. So be sure to tune in. We'll provide more information as we solidify what that is. All right. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching this episode of the behavioral view. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.